Well, today we began a brand new series called Unshakable. And what we're talking about is building an unshakable faith in God. During times like this, especially during times like this, we need an unshakable faith. Because I don't know about you, but there are times and events and circumstances that happen in our lives that cause us to feel a little shaky in what we believe. We're like, well, I know, I, I know what I believe, but is it really true? Uh, I know that God is with me, but sometimes it doesn't feel like he is. And so what you and I both need is to be able to have a, a faith that is unshakable, a faith that is built on something solid, a faith that is built on solid ground and solid foundation. So that's what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. We're going to talk about how that you can survive the storms of life, the circumstances that come your way, the hard questions that come your way. And we all have hard questions that come in our lives. There are going to be questions that come in your life that maybe you don't have the answer to. And so if we're going to survive those kinds of things, then what we must have is a faith that is built on a solid foundation. Jesus talked about this. He gave an example. One of the great stories he told was that there was a house that was built on sand. And when the storms came, it had a great destruction. But then there was someone that built a house on a rock, a solid foundation of rock. And when the storms came, that house did not move. Why? Because it had a very solid foundation. And so what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks is some fundamentals, if you will, some fundamentals of the Christian faith. How is it that you can uh, implement the fundamentals of the faith that will help you be stronger in your life as a Christian? Now, I want you to understand that these messages are going to be both for new Christians and seasoned Christians like me. I became a follower of Jesus when I was eight years old. I'm 56. I was just thinking about this backstage. For 48 years now, I've been a follower of Jesus. 48 years. But do you know that in spite of what I know, in spite of the foundation that I've built, there are some people that they don't have that foundation yet, so they got to build a foundation But then there are people like me that have been a Christian for a long time. I have a strong belief. I know what God has done. I believe the word of God. And what I need to do is not build a foundation, but I need to maintain that foundation. And so whether you've been a Christian for just a couple of weeks, this series is for you. Or if you've been a Christian a long time like me, you might need to maintain, do a little maintenance, a little reminding, because I know this, that Even for people that have a strong foundation, we must come back to the Word of God. We must build our lives on what the Bible says so that our faith will remain unshakable. When my dad uh, worked at at high school where I uh, graduated from, uh, he was the basketball coach. And uh, I remember trying out for the basketball team when I was in 10th grade. Now, I played basketball a lot in the backyard. I love basketball, love playing the game, but I never played organized basketball. So my 10th grade year was the first year that I tried out. And I remember going to tryouts, and it was was frustrating to me because I went out, I tried out to do what? To play basketball. That's what I wanted to do. Now, as a young man, man, I, I had some moves, you know, out in the driveway, and, and I knew what I wanted to do, but I'd never played a team sport uh, up until that time. And so for the first two weeks, now get this, at basketball tryouts, at basketball practice for the first two weeks, we did not even touch a basketball. And I'm like, what is this? What is up with this? This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. We're, we're supposed to be a basketball team, but we're not touching a basketball. What we did was we ran a lot. How many know what a suicide is? I don't mean like taking your life, but like, you know, a suicide in basketball where you run back and forth and uh, you got to do it faster. And my dad had a goal that somebody was to throw up every practice. It was not a good practice unless somebody threw up. Now, this was back in the day, you know, before we had all the knowledge about things that were really bad for you. And so my dad was of the old school tradition that, um, that water was for wimps, you know. 
And if you were thirsty, it meant you weren't trying enough, you know. So we ran our guts out. And we did, we did drills that I didn't think had anything to do with basketball. And then when we finally were able to touch a basketball, we didn't get to shoot. We did ball handling drills and passing drills and rebounding drills. And we were just like, when are we ever going to get to play the game of basketball? Well, what we did not know was that my father was drilling the fundamentals into us. And things that we were not even aware of or not familiar with when we started out became second nature to us because of the, get this, the fundamentals, the foundational aspect. And over the next three years, uh, our team won a lot of basketball games. And my senior year, we won the state championship in North Carolina because we learned the fundamentals. And so that's what I want to do for you. Over the next several weeks, we want to learn some fundamentals, and we're going to learn how to have an unshakable faith in God. And today, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about how to have an unshakable faith in God's Word. And when I say God's Word, I'm talking about the Bible. Now, if you're new to Christianity, new to faith, then maybe there are some, term, not, there's some terms that may confuse you. When we say the Word of God, we're referring to the Bible. And there's a reason we call it God's Word is because what the Bible calls itself is God's Word. It is from God. And so we're going to read this today, and we're going to study this a little bit today, uh, just so that you and I can build a firm foundation of faith. Now, the reason that we're starting out with talking about the Word of God first, rather than God or Jesus or, or whatever, and those are certainly important topics that we're going to talk about during this series, but the Bible is how we get to know God. The Bible is how we get to know God's ways. The Bible is how we get to know how to please God. And so if we don't get that part right, then none of the rest of it's going to be right in our life. So we're talking about today how to have an unshakable faith in God's Word, the Bible. I'm going to read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You can join me on the screen. If you have your phone, you can follow along. If you have a Bible, you can open it to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here's what it says. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, how much Scripture is inspired by God? All. All of it. Now, what's important is to know what is Scripture and what isn't, right? Because Scripture is inspired by God. Now, I want you to see the word inspired. The word inspired is maybe a different word than you think. Um, I don't know about you, but when I watch, was it Rocky Three or Rocky Four, where the eye of the tiger, remember that song? I can work out for like three minutes straight, you know? I mean, I'm so inspired, and I'm like ready to work out, and I'm listening to that song, you know, eye of the tiger, and boy, it inspires you, you know? Maybe there's something that inspires you like that. Well, that's not what that word means. It's not all scripture gets excited by God. The word inspired means God breathed. And so when it says all scripture is inspired by God, it means that God is responsible for scripture. Now, there are two things that are true about scripture, about its author. It's written by God and it's written by man. Now, you say, well, how can that be true? Well, there are many things in the Bible that are like that. Jesus Christ was both God, 100% God, but he's also 100% human. That way he could die for our sins. That way he could relate to us. And so there are many truths like that. The Bible is written by God, but God used men as instruments to write it. And it was not, they were not just dictated to. God used their personality and their brain and their experience but it was God breathed. In fact, the very first part of Scripture was written by the finger of God when God gave the law to Moses. And then Moses later wrote the first five books of the Bible. So uh, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's God breathed. It's from God. God used human authors to write it, but he also, it is from him. So that's very important. It is the word of God. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful. Now, there are some things that we do that are not very useful. You might spend a whole lot of time on Facebook. I'm not sure if that's useful or not. Some of it may be, but a lot of it, in my opinion, is a waste of time. Uh, you might spend a whole lot of time on 
uh, social media, or maybe you spend a whole lot of time watching Netflix or one of the other uh, streaming services, not everything we do is useful. But thank God the Word of God is useful in our lives. It's useful when you hear it taught. It's useful when you read it. It's useful when you meditate upon it. It's useful when you uh, allow it to sink into your life. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful. Notice what it's useful for. To teach us what is true. Can I just offer this? We need a North Star in our lives. We need something that is true that we navigate our life by. If there is no truth, you're open simply to relativism. And if there are no truths, if there is no right and wrong, we live a pure, miserable existence. If there's no truth, it doesn't really matter. Here's the thing. Truthfully, if there's no truth, then I can just break into your house and steal your stuff. And you say, well, that that would be wrong. Well, that's just according to you. If there's no objective standard, how do I know what is right and wrong? Okay? So the Word of God, it's our standard. It's useful. It teaches us what is true. It helps us realize what is wrong in our lives. Man, I need that. I read devotions this morning, reading out of the book of Romans about what God's doing in my life, what I need to correct in my life. God wants you to get better. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing that God wants us to do. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that um, God planned you that before you were ever even a Christian, before you were ever even saved, God had a plan for your life. He knew you were going to be born again. He knew that he had a plan for you to do the right things, to make a difference, not just to be like a knot on a log, but rather to be a person that makes a difference in this world. Now, the interesting thing is, this passage of Scripture, written by the Apostle Paul, it tells us that the Bible is what helps us to discover truth, to discover a North Star in our life, to have direction in our life, to know what is true and what is false, to know what is right and what is wrong, to know how to get better in our lives, to know what we should get rid of in our lives. It teaches us, but it also equips us. So in other words, if you want to please God, we can take from this passage of Scripture. If you want to please God with your life, if you want to do good things with your life, if you want to make a difference, if you want to be a person that lives the kind of life that God intended for you to live, there's one thing that you need to do in your life, and you need to get the Word of God into your life. You need to get the Bible into your life. And you say, how do you do that? Well, there are really a couple ways you do it. You hear the teaching of the Word of God like you're doing now. You watch it online. You listen to a podcast. You hear the teaching of the Word of God, but you also read the Word of God. Now, I know that there's some people that are not adept at reading. When you read, uh, it's difficult for you. It's difficult for you to comprehend. uh, But you do better by hearing stuff. Well, the good news is you can get the free app, the free Bible app on your phone, and you can have it read to you. You can have it read out loud to you, and it's absolutely free. There is no excuse for any person not to have the Bible in their life. And so it's all important that we learn how to have an unshakable faith in the Word of God. Now, I'm going to give you three thoughts today. They'll be done. Uh, Now, some of this is a little academic, so you'll have to uh, hang with me a little bit. But I believe that we need to hear this to build a strong and a firm foundation in our lives. Um, There are three thoughts I want you to get on how you can build an unshakable faith in the Bible. Because here's what I know. We live in a culture that does not have faith in the Word of God. We live in a culture that doubts whether it's even authentic. We live in a culture that many people, and by the way, there are not as many people that doubt it as you think. You can look at it online or watch the Discovery Channel or whatever, uh, you know, these TV shows are. Would it shock you to know that these television shows are going to tell you something that may not be true in order to get their ratings up? That wouldn't be shocking anybody, would it? The truth of the matter is, we can know the truth 
and we can have confidence in the Word of God. So I'm going to give you three thoughts on how to do that. Number one, very simple, believe the Bible is God's Word. That's where it starts. You must have faith that God's Word is true. You must have faith that what God tells us in His Word is true. Now you may say, well, what about all of the discrepancies in the Bible? That causes me to doubt. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that there are not questions or that there are not problematic texts, but here's where I stand, and I think this is where you need to stand. If I don't understand something about the Bible, I don't assume that the Bible is wrong. I assume that my understanding is incorrect, okay? And when you and I begin to believe that the Bible is the Word of God, God does not leave us out there like some cult that has no accountability. He doesn't require us to have faith without reason. In fact, the Bible tells us, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. God wants you to use your brain. God wants you to follow evidence, but the overwhelming evidence is that the Bible is from God, that it is God's Word. Now, let me just give you a few thoughts here. The Bible was written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors from different walks of life. There are 66 books in the Bible that make up the, the one book of the Bible, and they were all written at different times. They were written in three different languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. The Old Testament written in, in mostly Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic. The New Testament written in Koine Greek. Um, it was written on three different continents. It was written by kings and prime ministers and fishermen and tax collectors and priests and soldiers and shepherds and statesmen and physicians and rabbis and prophets and those with advanced education all the way down to common people. And there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. And for those of you that don't know, maybe you're new to Christian faith, the Old Testament was written before Jesus, and the New Testament was written after Jesus. That's a very simple way to remember uh, how that is, uh, is written. So the Bible is inspired by God. That's what we mean when we say God breathed. But we also believe here at Avalon Church that the Bible is inerrant. In other words, it's without error. Now, what do we mean by that? You got to be careful that you don't misuse or misunderstand a word. When we say the Bible is without error, we're not suggesting that there have never been any mistakes in copying Scripture. In fact, a number of years ago, I bought a Bible. We have modern-day computers, modern-day publishers, and very professional uh, proofreaders. And I bought a Bible that had an entire section, like two books of the Bible were missing. Now, when I bought that from the bookstore, did I go home and throw the Bible on the floor and say, there you go, you cannot trust the Bible. There are mistakes in it. Well, no, that was a mistake by a publisher. That was not a mistake of the inerrancy of the Word of God. When we say inerrant, we're talking about the Bible is true in all of the claims that it makes, all of it that it claims to be true. We're not suggesting that there was never a rabbi that misspelled a word as they were copying a text. Of course there were. What you got to be aware of is people that want to manipulate that to cause you not to have faith in the Bible. Um, many of you know that I'm a big North Carolina Tar Heel fan, University of North Carolina. At University of North Carolina, there is a professor, and his name is Dr. Bart Ehrman. And Bart Ehrman uh, started out, he went to Wheaton College, and he was planning on being a youth pastor. But as he began to study and began to go through college, he began to have severe doubts about the Bible. Well, he went on and uh, graduated with his PhD from uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. He went to good schools, but Dr. Bart Ehrman is an atheist. He is a New Testament scholar, there's no doubt about that, and he teaches at the University of North Carolina. Uh, he's a best-selling author, and um, he teaches New Testament and there's so many Christian uh, young people that start out their freshman or sophomore year at University of North Carolina, and they're like, hey, here's a Christian subject, and I'm going to go study the, uh, what the Bible says or what the New Testament says. Well, the problem is he is not just an atheist. He is an atheist evangelist. And what do I mean by that? In other words, he tries to recruit other people to be atheists. And one of the tactics he uses is he says, how many of you freshmen believe the Bible is God's word? Most of them raise their hand. He said, well, which word are you talking about? And he goes on to talk about how that there are more variants. In other words, there are different, more different words in the Greek manuscripts than there are actual words. Well, if you stop and think about that, that's not even possible, okay? But what he does 
is, for example, let's just assume that there are a thousand manuscripts of the Gospel of John, and let's say God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's say that one of the scribes that was copying this, he did not capitalize the, the letter G for the name God. Unlikely that he would do that, but let's just say that he did. He misspelled a word. Well, in the way they count that, that one misspelling would be a thousand, because there's a thousand manuscripts, a thousand variants. And so what happens is people often begin to hear things like this. And because they're not uh, educated with a seminary education, they begin to doubt the authenticity of the word of God. I can tell you this with absolute certainty. Uh, there are textual variants like that, yes, but 99% of them are just simply misspellings or punctuations or skipping a line or repeating a line twice or whatever. And so there are no variants at all that affect any truth, any teaching, any doctrine from the Word of God. So when we say that the Bible is without error, that's what we mean is that when God breathed it, when the authors originally wrote it, that it was without error. Now, does that mean uh, that the Bible is uh, against science? No, it does not. In fact, once again, I always assume that if there's something that I misunderstand or something that seems to be a contradiction, I just assume that my understanding of the Bible is not correct or my interpretation of that is not correct because although I believe the Bible is without error, I do not believe that mankind's interpretation is without error. Does that make sense? Okay. So the Bible, you got to believe that the Bible is the word of God. The Bible claims to be the word of God. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This little letter was written by the apostle Peter, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of the leading apostles when the church started. He said, for you have been born again. Your new life did not come from your earthly parents because the life they gave you will end in death, but this new life will last forever. Notice, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. So we can believe that the Bible is God's word. One reason is because the authors claimed it was the word of God. Once again, Peter writes this. He said, no prophecy ever came from what a person wanted to say, but people led by the Holy Spirit spoke words from God. So he was claiming that not only was this the word of God, but what these authors wrote was from God. These are words actually from God. Jesus himself claimed that the Bible is the word of God. Listen to what it says in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And by the way, the New Testament was not even written at that point. He was talking about the Old Testament. So your word is truth. Ancient manuscripts offer proof. Did you know that there are some 29,000 ancient manuscripts of the Word of God? Now, I know for some of you that doesn't really matter, um, but the fact is it is the most studied, the most critiqued um, book in the history of the world. And so we can trust that there's so much ancient manuscript evidence that we um, can, can trust in. Also, one of the most powerful things that I believe show, that shows that the Bible is God's word is the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, the Bible is 27% prophetic in nature. In other words, 27% of the words in the Bible are prophecies, okay? So when we understand the word of God, one of the important things about understanding how to interpret the word of God is understanding that the Bible, though it is one book, it's written it's 66 different books written by 40 different authors, and there are different genres of literature. Now, make no mistake, the Bible is literature. It is, in my opinion, the greatest literature in the history of the world. But there are histories. The, the uh, book of Genesis is a book of history. Now, once again, we need to understand if we're going to interpret what the Bible uh, says to be true then we must understand how these things work. Did you know that ancient histories don't work like modern history? If you read a modern day history book, what are they gonna do? They're gonna give you dates. 
the signing of the Declaration of Independence uh, in 1776, right? We celebrate July 4th as Independence Day. That's an important date. You couldn't just like in modern history, you couldn't just make up a date uh, because that's a very important thing. You, those are important things. But you know that in ancient times, those uh, dates and things of that nature were not important because what they did with history was write a narrative. They wrote a story. And so when you read the Old Testament and understand that there are histories in it, you got to understand how it's written. There's poetry and music in the Bible. Did you know that the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs and uh, the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon or Song of Songs and the book of Job, that these are poetic books? No, they're not 100% poetry. Some of it is uh, poetic in nature. Some of it is song in nature. Some of it is narrative in nature. But these are poetic books. And so let me just give you an example. Um, in the book of Song of Songs or the book of Song of Solomon, this is a book that describes the marriage relationship and the courting relationship between Solomon and one of his wives. I say one of his wives because he had 700 of them uh, at one point in his life, and he was called the wisest man in the world. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You say, what is a concubine? Concubine is, is kind of like a wife, but their children had no right of inheritance, okay? And so I heard one kid uh, came home from Sunday school, and his mom asked, what did you learn in Sunday school today? He said, well, we learned about Solomon. She said, what did you learn about Solomon? She said, we learned that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 porcupines. Well, Solomon, in writing this, he described his wife and her beauty. And here's what he wrote about her. He said, you have dove's eyes. He says, your teeth are sheep, everyone shorn. He said, your legs are ivory pillars. He says, your belly is a mound of wheat. Now, is there anybody here that really believes that this woman that he was in love with had legs that were made of ivory? Of course not. This is a poetic device describing her beauty. Um, do we believe that her eyes were actually the eyes of doves? Do we believe that her, her teeth were like uh, sheep? No, we don't believe that because that's poetry, right? There is apocalyptic literature in the Bible, which is like the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. Uh, there's narrative literature in the Bible. And so my point is this. In understanding the Bible, we must never make it make claims that it doesn't make, but we must understand that the Bible was written, it was God-breathed, written by men that were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it is without error, in other words, in the claims that it makes, are there controversies? Of course there are, but they're all able to be understood if you'll study it, okay? So you got to believe that the Bible is the Word of God. That's the first step. Um, prophecy is our greatest tool to show that the Word of God is supernatural in nature. There are some 800, I'm sorry, 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. 191 prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled. I want you to get that. 191 prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled. Did you know that for eight or 10 of those to be fulfilled is a math, by accident without supernatural uh, maintenance involved in that? Did you know that mathematically, mathematicians have done this, it is virtually impossible for it not to have had some supernatural knowledge, some supernatural author for just 10 prophecies about Jesus. For example, it was prophesied about Jesus that he would uh, be born of a virgin. It was prophesied about Jesus that he would be born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied about Jesus that he would live for a time in Egypt. These were prophecies that no one had any way of knowing that that was true other than from God. And so prophecies give us trust in the word of God. Well, let me just give you these next two thoughts. They won't be as long. The second thing you do to build an unshakable faith in the word of God is you got to receive the truth of the word of God. It's one thing to say you believe it. It's another thing to do what it says. If it is God's word, I am going to be held accountable for it, for what I do, how I respond to it, how I listen to it, okay? If it is the word of God, then I must be held accountable 
by it. Here's the thing about receiving the truth of the word of God. If there is no truth, then we have no standard and our view of God is completely subjective. The first few years of my Christian life as a young man, I saw God as the big guy in the sky with a stick that was going to whack me upside the head every chance he got because that, that was my vision of God. I did not see God as a loving God, a caring God that he is. So my view of God is very important. And how do I get the right view of God? From the Bible. That's how I get the right view of God. Um, our standard must be a, a, from the Bible because without this proper view and understanding, we're going to have a wrong view of God And God reveals himself to us through the Bible, and we get to know God by reading the Bible and hearing it taught. Listen to uh, John 8, verses 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, these are Jewish believers, become followers of Christ. He said, if you abide in my word, abiding there, trusting him in the Bible, he said, then you are truly my disciples, and notice what he said, you will know the truth. Man, if for no other reason, you ought to read the Bible because it will teach you the truth. It will teach you how to behave in a weird, wacky, wild culture that we live in today. It'll teach you what to know, how to, how to trust the truth, how to find the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, what we believe about the Bible determines how we answer the most basic questions of life. Like, what is real? What is God like? What is right? What is wrong? What is beautiful? What is the nature of humanity? Where do we come from? What is my purpose in life? How am I supposed to live? What is the solution to the problems in the world and in my world? And what happens when I die? These are all important questions of life that are answered for us through the Word of God. And our faith must be built on the Bible. Um, There are some proofs for the authenticity of the Bible. Let me just give you these quickly. The testimony of Christ, we've already talked about. Jesus said the Bible is the word of God. The manuscript evidence, we've talked about that. The biblical author said it was the word of God. The confirmation of miracles we find in the word of God, the chief one being the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, By the way, I don't know if you get inundated with stuff like this, but on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, Um, I get inundated with, because I I watch a lot of Christian apologetics, I get inundated with atheist uh, people that want to put out nonsense on YouTube about their atheistic views. And the majority of them, and and I'm I'm being trying to be kind here, the majority of them are uneducated, uninformed, and have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. So I I, I sometimes look at it. um, and But the fact is, when you begin to uh, talk about what the Bible actually is, what its claims are, and the proofs that it offers, then you don't really have to worry about what some nonsensical atheistic person has to say. You can trust the Word of God. We see the fulfillment of prophecy, the unity of the Bible. How miraculous is it that 66 different books by 40 different authors was written over 1,500 years, and they didn't know each other, and yet there's complete unity in the Bible. How is that possible apart from the supernatural interaction of God? We look at the archaeological confirmations. Once again, God doesn't expect you to have no reason, uh, but there's so many archaeological confirmations and so on and so forth. I believe that the spread of the gospel around the world is a reason to believe that it is supernatural in nature. I believe that the counterintuitive features, for example, it depicted Jesus' anger. If this was a myth, if it was some made-up story, you would not include stuff like that in there. You would not include the failures of real people. But there are eyewitnesses to what Jesus did and said. Now, the Bible has been considered complete by the church with very little controversy since a couple hundred years after Christ. It's important to note that though church councils settle the issue, the Bible is inspired by God and discovered by men. Decisions by the councils did not determine the books of the Bible. They merely recognized which books were authentically inspired scripture. Can I just say this? Uh, Some of you probably have heard uh, that, you know, these councils 
had all these arguments about uh, what books of the Bible belonged and that books of the Bible that were discovered later, uh, there's so much controversy and we can't really trust it. For example, the Gospel of Thomas. Somebody probably heard of that. Well, the Gospel of Thomas was written by a charlatan. It was proved within a couple of years after he wrote it, and it was not only written by a charlatan, but its claims were completely false and completely rejected by the church. That was never even considered to be a part of the Bible by the church. And so we must understand these things if we're going to understand the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, there are some questions that they would ask, but I won't uh, talk about that. The final thought is this. Build your faith by reading God's Word. So if I'm going to have an unshakable faith, I've got to understand, I've got to believe that the Bible is God's Word. I've got to receive the truth of the Word of God. In other words, on a regular basis, feed my soul with it. And number three, I need to read it. I need to take it in my life. You want to be a better Christian? Read the Bible. You want to know more about Jesus? Read the Bible. You should listen to teaching, yes, but read the Bible. You can read it on your own. You say, well, what if I don't understand it? Well, it's kind of like Mark Twain said. It's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me so much. It's the parts that I do understand. You see, when I understand that the Bible teaches in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, that is not hard to understand. It is very hard to practice. Okay? So we need to begin to read the Bible and understand that God will work in our life. The Bible says in Romans, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Build your faith by the word of God. Now there are two things I wanna close with today. Number one, do you need to trust Jesus as your savior? Those of you in our online community, we're so glad that you're a part of our church. I wanna ask you a very serious question. Do you know Christ as your savior? If not, I wanna invite you to trust Jesus today. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God and that you died for me and for my sins. And I'm trusting you right now that you not only rose from the grave, but that you will be my savior if I'll ask. And right now I ask you to come into my life, give me the faith to trust and believe in you. If you'll pray that prayer, I want you to mark online that you pray to receive Christ today. If you're in our room today, and thank God for all of you that are. If you trust Christ today, if you prayed that prayer, you wanna pray that prayer, take one of the next step cards out of the seat in front of you and mark on there that you prayed to receive Christ and drop it in the drop box on the way out today. We wanna rejoice with you because no matter what, uh, salvation is the most important first step. You know that we've had people in our church that were highly intelligent and very skeptical, came in as, as atheists. There's one man that was very highly educated, very highly intelligent, and he had a lot of skepticism about Christianity. And all I told him, I said, look, you need to read the book of Romans. And because he was so inquisitive, he read the book of Romans. In fact, he read it about four or five times. And after reading the book of Romans, this is a man that was an atheist when he started. And by the time he finished reading the book of Romans, he told me, he said, I had to receive Jesus because it's impossible that it's not true. I love that. And the fact is, you and I can receive Christ today if we never have. And then the other question is this. Are you building your life on an unshakable foundation of the Word of God? Do you read the Bible? In fact, let me just, let's get real honest, okay? A lot of times in church, we're like, let's bow our heads and have nice music playing so you get in the mood. But let's just be real honest today. How many would say, I read my Bible, but not as consistently as I should? Would you raise your hand, just being honest? Majority of the crowd. That's what I thought. Because you know what? That's a struggle that every Christian has. So you don't need to beat yourself up. If you said, I'm going to read the Bible through this year, and by the end of January, you'd already missed a few days, don't give up. Start back, okay? And, and, and it's important that you read the Bible. It's important that you can listen to it. You listen to it taught. I mean, there are many, many ways. I get it if you're not a good reader. 
if you don't receive instruction well that way, if you're more audio uh, or visual learner or whatever, um, then use what works. That's my point. And so I want to ask this question then for those of you that were honest and said, I, I need to read my Bible more. How many would say today, pastor, I not only want you to pray that God will help me be more faithful in reading my Bible, but I'm making a commitment today because I need to build the foundation of my faith. I'm making a commitment that this week, and I'm not going to ask you to make a commitment for the rest of your life, but this next week that I'm going to read the Bible at least five times, at least five times. Now, before you raise your hand, let me explain that. I don't mean you have to read 10 chapters every time or the entire book of Genesis, okay? But like, you're going to read the Bible. You can get on the Bible app. You can uh, read just a few verses a day, but for five out of the next seven days, by next Sunday, I'm going to read the Bible at least five times. Would you raise your hand? Heavenly Father, we commit this to you. We commit our faith to you, our belief to you. We commit um, our trust in the Word of God to you. Lord, for those that prayed to receive Christ today, that joined us around the world and around our state online, I pray that this will be the beginning of a beautiful relationship, that you'd help them get more connected so they can grow in their faith. For everyone that says, I'm going to read the Bible this week, God, I pray that you'd help us to remember that, uh, set a reminder on our phone, remind ourselves daily. Do it when we get up in the morning. Do it at lunchtime or at night before we go to bed. But whatever we choose, Lord, help us to be consistent with it. And Lord, help us to know that we will be stronger for it. Of course, in Jesus' name that I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.